21st Precinct, Sergeant Collins. Yes, I can hear you. What's the trouble there? Was she all alone? Well, how much is on the clock? Four dollars and what? Why can't you pay it? Oh, yeah. You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. The call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right, drive ahead to the station house. We'll talk about it when you get here. Well, just come on over here and we'll get it all settled. Yeah, all right. I'll see you. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Cronin, Vincent P. Cronin. I'm captain in command of the 21st Precinct. I was doing night duty, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. At 1.55 a.m., after I'd been on patrol of the precinct, since turning out for platoon at midnight, I returned to the station house where Lieutenant Snyder was desk officer and Sergeant Collins had telephone switchboard duty. As I came through the door into the muster room, I saw a hack driver and a well-dressed, very pretty young woman, about 20, standing in front of the desk. I walked around behind the desk to sign the block. What's doing, Sergeant? Nothing much, Skipper. It's been a quiet tour. Look, I've got no time to stand here and discuss the pros and cons. There was $4.40 on the clock. All I want is my money, that's all. I'd tell you that if I had it. Skipper. Hello, Lieutenant. I told you I lost my wallet. Well, you just give me $4.40. That's all I want. She says she's lost her wallet. Well, why couldn't she look and see if she had a wallet before she got in my car in Idlewild Airport? Why did she have to wait until we got to 80th Street and Park Avenue before she found it out? It so happens I looked in my purse for a cigarette and I noticed the wallet was missing. I told you I'd give you a check. Lady, when I turn the cab in at 7 o'clock in the morning, the boss wants cash for what's in the clock. He doesn't want checks. I don't have the cab. I lost my wallet. Oh, why do I get all the sad stories? I've never seen it to fail. Where were you going from Idlewild, miss? She said Frank Station. What's your name? Me? Yes. Elizabeth Sanderson. Do you have any identification? No, all my identification is in my wallet. I've got my checkbook, though. I am not interested. Uh, what's your name, Kevin? Calafo, Joe Calafo. Look, Joe, these things happen. But always for me. Why? Who are you, anyway? He's Captain Cronin, the commanding officer of the precinct. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I'd just like to know who I'm talking to. <laughs> You're wasting your time here, Joe. Oh, that's not news to me. I didn't want to come here. <laughs> Joe, Joe, I suggest you take the lady's check, get back on the job. You don't want to make a complaint, go to court, do you? Got a good mind just oh, to do that. What does that mean? Have you arrested? You know anybody around here you can call, Mess, you know, to get the money from? I don't know a soul, not a soul. I'm from out of town. You don't want to spend the morning in court, do you, Joe? I want to spend the morning in the bed. All right, give me the check and let me get out of here. Oh, I really appreciate it. You don't know how much I appreciate it. I know, I know. Here, do you want a pen? Oh, yes, thanks. Thanks a lot. How do you want it made up? Just the cash. That's good enough. It was $4.40. I'll make it $6. That'll be a good tip for you for all the trouble I cost. That's up to you, lady. Uh. Yeah? <laughs> no. I lost my wallet. I don't have a cent of cash. I couldn't make the check for $10 and you give me $4 change. No, you couldn't. Listen, just make it for $4.40. Just give it to me and let me get out of here and don't do me any favors. All right. Well, you're hey, hard to ask. I'm stuck enough already. Yes, yeah, so hold on. Got him thrown in division on the line for you. Okay. Clean up against the desk and write the check. It's all right. I'll take it here. It's here. 21st Street, thank Captain Cronin. Oh, yes, Inspector. No, sir. No, I'll be swinging on Sunday. No? No, sir. I, uh, well, I hadn't heard about it, Inspector. All right, I'll, uh, I'll leave the instructions for the sergeants to ride by there frequently and have a look. How's that? Yes, sir. All right, Inspector. Okay. I really died to cause so much trouble. I made it for $6 anyway. 
it's here. It's Blackton, Pennsylvania. Where's Blackton, Pennsylvania? It's near Philadelphia. Did I get this pen from you? That's right. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Can I go now? Yes, go ahead. Well, I'll be seeing you. Goodbye. You can't blame him, I guess. I couldn't help him. Lieutenant Singleton is ringing in. You wanted to talk to him. You live in Blackstone? Yes, put him on here. Yes, sir, that's right. Near Philadelphia. 21st birthday. And uh, what are you doing in New York? Well, listen, you put on identifier. Oh, it's a long story. Uh, Miss, would you walk across into my office? I want to talk to you. Which is right. Over there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you just have a seat in there. Well, how do you spell that? Yes, sir, if you want. B-L-E or T-L-E? Sergeant, did you check to see if a wallet was turned in at Idlewild? No, sir. They, they just came in a minute before you did. All right, give the Port Authority police a ring out there, see if they found it. Yes, sir. The way to handle it is registered under another name. Is this chair all right? Yeah, that's chair. Fine, sorry. Elizabeth Pendleton. How you spell that? P-E-N-D-E-R-T-E-N. Yes. What were you doing at Idlewild, Miss Pendleton? Well, you see, I came to New York on the train with a friend of mine. He flew to Europe. Mm. And I... Was going back to Philadelphia. All right, now, come on, come on. Everything's okay. I'm sorry. I put her on the plane, and I took a cab to go back to Penn Station. When I opened my pocket for a cigarette, I noticed my wallet was missing. That's all there is to it. I couldn't help her. Yeah, no. Look, did you have your pocketbook open at the airport? Oh, yes, several times. I bought her a couple of magazines, and we went into the bar and had a drink. Several times. You didn't miss it before you got into the cab. No, sir. I told you. I was going to smoke a cigarette. Mm -hmm. You were on your way to Penn Station. You get a train to Philadelphia? Yes, sir. That's right. To Philadelphia. Well, then I'd have to change there for Braxton. It's on the other side of Philadelphia. On the main line. Well, I really couldn't help it. I can't blame the cab driver for being mad. He's entitled to his money, but I couldn't help it. I didn't want to leave my wife. Yes, sir. I know. You have any friends in New York? Well, there are a couple of people... Girls I went to school with. But I wouldn't know where they are exactly. Would you like to make a collect call to your home? Oh, I don't think that would be a good idea at this time of night. You see, I didn't even tell my father and mother I was coming to New York. They get scared to death. He's nervous anyway. He's probably not at home. He stays in town a lot. In Philadelphia, that is. Did you ever hear of him? No, I don't think so. Charles B. Pendleton? He's a pretty big man. No, no. Well, if you don't call him, you'll have to do something. All I want to do is get to Penn Station and get on the train, that's all. I had a return ticket, but that was in my wallet, too. Mm-hmm. How much money did you have? Oh, I don't know. Thirty-five or $40, dollars, something like that. Not much. Yeah, excuse me. Twenty-five, three, thank you. Captain Cronin. Sergeant Collins on TS, Captain. I called the Port Authority Police at Idlewild. There's been no wallet turned in. Okay, thanks, Sergeant. Your wallet hasn't been turned in, Senator. Not oh, yet. I don't know what I'm going to do. Look at me. I look terrible, don't I? Oh, well, now, come on. There's no reason for you to be crying. I'll be all right. If I just had the money to get home, that's all I need. About ten dollars. Captain, would you cash a check for me for $10? Uh, Mr. Pendleton. $10, that's all. I could get a train home and pay the cab from the Braxton station to my house. That's all it would take for $10. <laughs> Look, Miss Anderson, if I, if I cash a check for everybody to walk in that door... Oh, it's good. I promise it's good. Yes, I, I, I don't doubt Look, that. Look, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll leave my watch with you. It's a beautiful watch. My father gave it to me. Seventeen jewels and a gold case. You keep it until you're sure about the check, and then you can send it to me. Well, never mind the watch, Miss Hendon. Just write out the check. I'll oh. cash it for you. Oh, thank you. You don't have any idea how this saved my life. It really saved my life. I took the young woman's check and gave her ten dollars from my own pocket. She powdered her nose, thanked me profusely, and left the station house at 2.20 a.m. The rest of the tour was quiet. 
I turned out the platoon for the 8 to 4, signed the blotter, and left the station house to go off duty. 24 hours later, I reported back, and after signing the blotter and changing the uniform, I turned out the platoon and returned to my office to read the reports and communications which had accumulated during my time off. These I signed while I spoke to Ezra D. Winkler, the precinct youth patrolman, in regard to his progress in organizing softball teams among the youth of the precinct. A few minutes later, I walked out into the muster room. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Collins. Oh, Ross. Uh, walk around the 346 and see the super. City Marshal is on his way to serve an eviction notice, and the super says the tenant might give a little trouble. He's a fighter. Yeah, that's right. Okay, let me know. What's doing, Sergeant? Nothing much, Skipper. It's pretty quiet. Hey, Captain. You got a minute? Yeah, sure. Hello, oh, man. All right. Hello, Lieutenant King. How are you? What's the trouble, man? Listen, Captain, did you take a check from a girl a few days ago, a kid 18 to 20, honey-colored hair, very pretty? She uses the name Penderton. Yeah, that's right. It's Pendleton. How'd you know about it? Well, somebody around here mentioned it yesterday that the girl came in the other night claiming she lost her purse. Couldn't pay the cab driver. Yeah, that's right, Matt. The special fraud squad had me on the phone this morning, told me about her. Uh, this babe has been plastering the town with those checks. And sufficient funds? No, just forgery. Who is she, Matt? You know? Enough, sir, but she's really been laying down that paper. Just small amounts. She sure has been getting away with it. I don't see how she does it. I do, Matt. The kid sold me a bill of goods. Came in here with a real sad, sob story about losing her money. Yeah, that's what she's been using, according to them downtown. The same story. She's hit about 35, 40 times. Still going strong. Mm-hmm. She sold me. She really sold me. Yes, sir. Sweet, innocent, and in trouble. <laughs> I can see how she was able to hang that paper all over town. She sold you, Captain. This next time, take my advice and be careful. See you. You know, Matt, next time I think I'll just take the watch. Later in the day, a teletype alarm for the young woman who had forged the name of Elizabeth Pendleton on more than three dozen checks and passed them on various merchants and individuals in the city of New York was received at the station house. But the alarm didn't stop her. In the next few days, a dozen more such checks were refused payment by the bank in Braxton, Pennsylvania. In New York, the investigation was handled by detectives of the various precincts in which the checks were passed. And the Special Fraud Squad, one of the several organizations of specialized investigators, cooperate on a citywide basis from the central office. In the meantime, the tour-by-tour activities in the 21st Precinct continued. On Saturday, we had a bad homicide. On Sunday morning, a seven-year-old girl on her way to church was struck by a hit-and-run drive on First Avenue. Both of her legs were broken. I returned to the station house at 11.40 a.m. from the scene of that accident. In the muster room, Sergeant Collins was on telephone switchboard duty, and Lieutenant Snyder was the desk officer. I walked behind the desk to sign the blotter. All right, Captain. Uh, watch the pen. Huh? Oh. Oh, what's doing, Harry? Oh, nothing much, Captain. Got the hit and run. Yes. I'll be in my office. I've got a few messages for you, Skipper. Yes, sir. That Mr. Thompson wouldn't leave his first name. He said he'd call back. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I know who he is. Oh, uh, is this one Congressman Mohawk? Yes, sir, that's right. He said he'd be at that number until 2.30 p.m. All right, you can get the Congressman for me. Yes. I'll take it to my office. Where will I find Captain Cronin, please? Over here, ma'am. You'll have to make inquiries at the desk. That's all right, Lieutenant. I'm Captain Cronin. Oh, how do you do? I'm Mrs. Elizabeth Pendleton. Of Philadelphia? Of Braxton, Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia. You know me. Well, let's say I've heard of you. Well, I'd like to talk to you, Captain. Shall we? And here, Mrs. Pendleton. Thank you. Double seat. Thank you. Well, somebody's been using your name in vain, Mrs. Pendleton. That's what I want to talk to you about, Captain. How do you spell your name uh, with a Y or an I? An I. C-R-O-N-I-N. It was Mrs. Sykeson who served with me on my hospital committee. She was a Cronin, but a Cronin with a Y. I don't suppose she's your family. Mm, no, I'm afraid not. <laughs> well, what can I do for you, Mr. Pendleton? You know, I'm not handling the investigation. I'm just another victim in this case. Yes, and it's too bad. 
I know you were just performing an act of kindness. You were being a good Samaritan. No, I was trying to be. You were. And I want to make restitution for the $10 you lost. You're under no obligation to do that, Mrs. Pennington. I think I am. It was $10, wasn't it? Those checks were forged on your bank account. The responsibility belongs to the first and daughter. The responsibility belongs to me, Captain. You see, I know who forged all those checks. Huh? You do? Who? Well? Uh, Miss Shears. Oh, of course. Twenty first precinct, Captain Cronin. I have Congressman Moho for you, Captain. All right. I'll just be a minute, Mr. Penton. Well, that's quite all right. Twenty first precinct, Captain Cronin. Hello, Vance. Congressman, I uh, tried to reach you yesterday. Uh, yes, I know. I'm sorry I didn't get back to you. What can I do for you, Vance? Oh, just a little information. That's all, Congressman. Uh, you know Father Canaan and Saint Agnes? Uh, yes, I do. Well, you see, he has a student. He's very interested in. Boy just finished his first year at CCNY. He's had excellent marks. He's right up there at the top of his class, Congressman. He's a good athlete, nice young man. Yes? Well, you see, there's not much money in the family. They uh, just have a little hardware store. Well, though the boy wants to get into West Point, and, uh, well, I think he'd be a, a good cadet. Father Canem knows their competitive examination before you make your appointments, and he just wants to find out how to go about getting him on the list. So I told him I'd call you. Sure, man. I'll have my administrative assistant get in touch with Father Kanan, all right? Fine. Fine. Uh, you want the boy's name? No, no, not yet. We'll get all the information from Father Kanan. Thanks for calling, Vince. Well, thank you, Congressman. Bye. <laughs> Once a good Samaritan. Always a good Samaritan. It's all part of the job, Mr. Penton. Now, you say you know who forged those checks. Yes, I do. Who? My daughter. Your daughter? Don't look so surprised, Captain. I have a daughter that age. My daughter, Elizabeth. So you see, it's really not forgery. Her name is Elizabeth Pendleton, too. It's not really forgery. Does she have an account at that bank? No, but she has an account in the bank in Philadelphia in her own name. She has money in there, plenty of money. I deposit $50 a week to her account. I don't understand why she does it. I just don't understand. Have any police officers come to see you at your home, Mrs. Pendleton? Oh, yes, a very nice young detective from the Pennsylvania State Police. A very nice young man. Did you tell him that you suspected it was your daughter? No. Why not? Well, my husband told me not to. I wanted to tell the bank to pay the check just to let them go through, but my husband told me not to do that either. Do you have any idea why your daughter's doing this? You know, she's forged and passed nearly 40 checks in New York City alone. No, I don't know. I really don't. She's had everything all of her life, everything. There's not a thing she's wanted that we didn't give her. And she just left home all of a sudden, and the next thing we knew, the check started. I didn't even know that she was in New York. Why did she leave home, Mrs. Pendleton? I... I don't know. There must have been a reason. There was something with her father. Yes? What? Well, it's really very personal. Mrs. Pendleton, your personal matter isn't personal anymore. It's very public. About 40 people in New York are victims of it. I'd rather not go into it. I'm afraid you'll have to. Well, I'm involved in it, too, in a manner of speaking. Yes? You see, my husband was away. He told us that he was going to Chicago on business. The weekend came and Liz was invited out to Wilmington to a party on Saturday night. She didn't want to go. She never wanted to go, but I, I talked her into it. Anyway, she went. She had a very good time, and after the party, the young hostess and her friends decided to go to an inn on the shore for coffee and a snack. She, um, saw her father there. Oh. He was with another woman. How old is uh, Liz? Nineteen. She'll be twenty in October. Did she talk to her father? No. Luckily, he didn't see her. But she came home very upset. I had no idea what the trouble was. Finally, on Monday or Tuesday, she spoke to me. She told me she had seen her father and what the circumstances were. Well, I said, Liz, I'm sorry you had to find out this way, but it's been going on for years. Your father has his friends and I have mine. That's the way it is. What did she say to that? Nothing. Nothing at all? Well, as a matter of fact, I was just on my way out of the house when I told her I was very late for a dinner party. Did she leave home right away? Oh, no. In a day or so. Do you have any idea where she's staying in New York? No. Could she be with some friends? She has only one friend here. I called her even before the check started, but she hasn't heard from Liz. Captain, that girl has had the best education money can give her. She's had a car all her own, a 1955 convertible, all her own. She has clothes, lots of clothes, and money of her own. What made you decide to come to New York, Mrs. Pennington? 
I wanted to find her and bring her home. That's a natural thing for a mother to do. I want to get things straightened out. Besides, my friends were beginning to ask questions. Does your husband know you came? No, he'd be against it. He's afraid she'll cause a lot of trouble. He doesn't want any trouble or any scandal. He's very annoyed with me. Yes. And I have to admit, I don't understand myself what's gotten into her. Why would she do a thing like this to me? Well, I'm not sure I can answer that, Mrs. Pendleton. I'm only a policeman. I took Mrs. Pendleton upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad and introduced her to Lieutenant King. She repeated the story she told me and insisted she had no idea where her daughter could be located. A new alarm was put out for the young woman and a communication to the Pennsylvania State Police advised them of the actual circumstances in the case. The next day, a teletype order came through from the chief inspector instructing each precinct commander to make a personal check of cabarets in his command. Delegates at two recent conventions had complained that they were being overcharged in a few midtown nightclubs. In order to accomplish this work as speedily as possible, I decided to visit the cabarets in my command in company with a patrol sergeant on his regular inspection. Well, everything looks all right in here, Skipper. Yep. Yep. How about the kitchen? Did you take a look in there? Yes, sir. Are they prepared to serve food? Yes, sir. The cook on the job. Mm-hmm. Oh, I... All right, sir. Let's go. Well, we're here. We can take a look at that club around the corner, Captain. Now, let's see. Oh, just a second. Wait a minute. There's someone at the bar I want to talk to. Yes, sir. That depends, honey. That depends <laughs> on how you feel about it. Excuse me, Miss Ames. Me? What's the trouble? I want to talk to the young lady. What do you want to talk to me about? Listen, officer, we didn't do anything. I'd like to know what you want to talk to me about. Listen, what's the trouble, anyway? What's your name, Mr. Why do you want to know that? Because this girl is one of the passing 39 Ford checks. That's why. Oh, don't kid me. It's so, Carl. It's absolutely so. Well, listen, I... I only met her tonight, an hour ago. What's your name? Uh, Langby. Carl Langby. That's the truth. You can ask her. Isn't it the truth? It's the truth. Did you cash a check for her, Mr. Langby? Me? No. You would have, Carl. You would have. Everybody does, even the policeman. Everybody loves me. Everybody. I called Sergeant Collins over, and we took Liz Pendleton and a companion to the station house. Well, we went directly upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad. After a few minutes of questioning, Carl Langby convinced Lieutenant King that he had, in fact, only met the girl that evening in another bar. He gave his address and promised to appear again if needed. He was allowed to go. Then Lieutenant King and I talked to the girl. Is that the only reason, Liz? Well, I had to live. You want to call your mother? You can place a call to her. No, I don't want to call her. I don't want to talk to her. Well, if you don't, Liz, I do. Can I use this one, Matt? Yes, sir, that's all right. I haven't anything to say to her. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Collins. This is Captain Cronin. Yes, sir. Sergeant, will you step into my office, look in the corner of my desk flatter? There's a note there with the number of a Mrs. Elizabeth Panderton in Braxton, Pennsylvania. Braxton? Yes, that's right. Place a collect call to Mrs. Panderton at that number. I'll be up here. Right away, Captain. You have a bank account of your own, Liz. Why did you have to forge checks in your mother's name? I don't know. It just seemed as though I should. Well, what made you? I don't know. If I knew, I'd tell you. You know, you hurt a lot of people. Did I? I didn't mean to. About 40 people, including Captain Cronin. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt anyone. You know I'm sorry, Captain. I hope you are. I didn't mean to hurt anyone. I just... wanted to get money from people to prove they liked me. That's all. If they were willing to take a check from me, that proved they liked me, didn't it? That's all I wanted to prove. Could have given checks from your own account to prove the same thing. No, that's not so. It wouldn't prove the same thing. It wouldn't prove the same thing because... I don't know. It just wouldn't. Liz, what were you doing at Idlewild that night? Idlewild? The airport. When? The night you said you didn't have the money to pay the cab driver. Oh. What were you doing there? I just went out there to cash a check, that's all. I thought it would be a nice place. I'm sorry. I didn't realize I would cause so much trouble. I really didn't. But that's my mother. I don't want to talk to her. I really don't. I'll get it, ma'am. I yeah. won't. 21st Precinct, Captain Cronin. Sergeant Collins on TS, Captain. I have Mrs. Pendleton. All right, put her on. Go ahead, please. Hello? Captain Cronin. Yes, this is Captain Cronin. We have Liz here, Mrs. Pendleton. Oh, you have? How is she? Is she all right? 
I won't talk to her. Yes, she seems all right. May I talk to her? Liz? No. I told you no. I'm sorry, Mr. Pendleton. She won't come to the phone. Why won't she? No, she just refuses. Tell her I'll be there. Tell her I love her. Tell her I'll take the next train. Her father, too. All right, Mr. Pendleton. Goodbye. The next I couldn't talk. I'm sorry, but I couldn't. I'm not ashamed of anything. But I couldn't talk to her. Your mother said to tell you she loves you. She and your father are taking the next train. They won't be here. They told the captain they would? No, they won't. All they'll do is send money. They always send money. They think that's the same thing, but it isn't. It really isn't the same, is it? No, Liz. Now, there's all the difference in the world. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Collins. You lost your wife? Your son. How old is he? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. James Gregory in the role of Captain Cronin, and Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Bill Zuckert, Les Damon, Joan Loring, Abby Lewis, George Petrie, and Frank Campanella. 21st Precinct is written, produced, and directed by Stanley Niss. Art Hannah speaking. <laughs>